Welcome to Southwest Iceland and another edition of Random Road Cuts, the video series where we pick a random road cut, just stop along the side of the road, get out and make some fairly simple but powerful observations together and see if we can put together the geologic story that exists here. Thanks for joining me. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey here on the shores of Lake Klevravat in the Krišuvik volcanic system of southwest Iceland on the Reykjanes Peninsula. And we're here right along Road 42, which runs through this spectacular scenery. And we stopped to check out this road cut. So let's go ahead, walk across the road and take a look together. So as always, we'd like to start with just what we know regionally. And of course, we're here in Iceland where volcanic rocks tend to dominate, although there are a few sedimentary rocks here and there as well. And the geology of Iceland involves you know, glacial ice, water, along the coast, different types of uh, coastal processes, and of course, volcanoes and earthquakes. So probably a good taste of what we're in for here today. But let's go ahead and start here, maybe at the left end of the, the cut, and then we'll work our way down uh, behind the rental van there and take a look at the road cut. So let's just go ahead and take a look at these uh, exposure so you can see the first thing that's super obvious is the layering here super intricate layering uh, different thicknesses of layers um, when we think about layered rocks we think one about maybe metamorphic rocks but those are completely outside the realm of possibility here in Iceland so then we think about sedimentary processes or volcanic processes but either way it's something at the surface so we've got some sort of rock that has been deposited at the surface either through uh, erosional processes in the sedimentary world or possibly volcanic processes. Let's just take a look at this stuff. You can see uh, it's made out of mostly chunks of rock. So we have fragments of rocks of different shapes and sizes throughout the unit. You can see some of them are pretty big, you know, golf ball size or larger, but in other places, the rock particles are quite fine grained. And there seems to be some variability in terms of uh, not just size, but just sort of the ordering of the sediments here. This is a pretty good example here of what we would call a graded bed. You can see the larger particles here at the bottom. You can see how big those are in relation to my hand, almost fist sized particles. And then as we move up through this unit, you can see the grain size decreases to kind of marble size, and then it increases to even finer material, almost sand size. So whenever we see this overall um, fining upwards trend, that indicates a decrease in energy. Whatever was moving and transporting these particles had enough energy to move these larger particles. But as time went on, whatever the event was that moved these particles, that energy level decreased. And we see smaller particles grading into even finer particles up the sequence. So this is again, what's known as a, a graded bed and common in flood deposits. So you often see it associated with river deposits, but as we look at these particles, look at their shapes. I mean, these are quite angular particles. They look to be made of all the same rock type. It doesn't look like there's any other rock types in here. Again, just based mostly on color. Um, and so this is more likely not a stream deposit, but rather a volcanic eruptive event where we were transporting these really large particles and then the energy perhaps waned in that a little bit and you get the finer material. And you can see it fluctuates. We have the larger particles down here, grades into finer particles, picks up a little bit here with a few more larger particles, fine again. Then we get up into this region up here and the particles increase a little bit. So it seems to indicate that whatever eruptive event was going on here, it was moving particles with different levels of energy, maybe pulsating a little bit. We can also see that because the material is all broken up and disaggregated, that this would be a fairly explosive event. This would be breaking rocks up and throwing them out, what we call pyroclastic material. So far, we haven't seen any intact lava flows, any outcrops of uh, continuous basalt that are often quite dominant in parts of Iceland. 
So this indicates we have a fairly explosive event that's fragmenting the rocks, breaking them up into pieces, and then transporting them through the air where they land on the ground and start to uh, build up and be deposited. So let's go ahead across this little grassy slope. Actually, let's go down so we're not walking across the vegetation and check out this other section here. This spot looks a little different. Um, you can see that there's uh, an interesting feature over here, this kind of light colored material or a sort of thin finger that kind of cuts through the rock from the lower left to the upper right. That kind of caught my eye, but let's start just a little bit uphill of that and kind of grade into that material. Let's work our way up here. Okay, so here we have more of the same, this sort of fragmented rock here. They're more like, again, fist size or even larger particles, sort of loosely glued together. You can see a lot of them are basalt. You can see the, the vesicles, little gas bubbles in the rock here. Um, so again, looks to be some sort of explosive eruptive event that's depositing this material. Back where we were at the first stop, we saw some bedding. We saw organization to the particles. But as we work our way into this section, it's highly unorganized. It's just chaotic mixture of big particles, smaller particles, just all glumped together without any organization. Or it could be possible that this is all one large bed and we just can't see enough of the exposure to see how thick it is. So either possibility um, at play there. And then we end up down here at this very cool feature that caught my eye that cuts its way up through the rock, this lighter material here. Um, and let's take a look at this. So it looks like the material on either side is more or less the same. It's this lighter rock here. It's mostly these ash sized particles with occasional big blocks. So if we're gonna start giving this name uh, because we have mostly volcanic ash, we could call this a tuff. But if you wanted to go in favor of the more, um, you know, in taking into account these larger angular particles in the rock, you could call it a breccia, or you could just kind of couch the two together and call it a tough breccia. Sometimes we use one rock type as an adjective or modifier of, of another one. So even though tough and breccia are their own distinct rock types, uh, if you have a little bit of both, um, it sometimes is appropriate to combine those terms together. So we have the tough breccia on this side. We have the same material over here with the larger particles. But then looking at this feature here, um, it looks a lot like a dike, right? It looks a lot like a, a thin uh, zone of rock that cuts across the existing rock. But a dike, a true dike, most dikes are igneous in nature. They are made out of crystals. It's an intrusion of magma that cuts its way through the rock and then cools and crystallizes. And when we look at this, it actually is really fine grained. This is not a crystalline rock. It's kind of smooth. Um, kind of breaks into little chips almost in places, but the grain size here is quite fine. The other thing we sometimes see with, with dikes when they're uh, igneous uh, is we'll see some sort of color change on either side of that uh, because the, sometimes the heat of the magma can bake or cook these rocks that formed at the surface and sometimes leave a little bit of a color change there. And I'm really not quite seeing that here. This is uh, an interesting bit of material here. So this, and, and it's not an igneous dike, and yet it doesn't look like a lot of the clastic dikes I've seen. Clastic dikes can form dominantly from earthquakes. It's where a slurry of groundwater and sediment moves up through a fracture. And then while the shaking takes place and the, the liquefaction of that material moves up through the fracture. And then when the earthquake ends, it sort of solidifies in place. But usually when we have clastic dikes, we tend to see uh, pebbles like coarser material throughout the deposit. And again, we're just not seeing that in here, this lighter 
material. So I'm not totally sure what to make of it. Um, if I had to switch over to interpretation mode and, and hazard a guess, because we're fairly close to uh, just down the road here to the south, we have a, a hydrothermal area with hot springs and mud pots. It's possible that this represents uh, hot groundwater moving through the rock, through fractures in the rock, and then precipitating out some sort of mineral deposit. So this might be more appropriately called a vein because it maybe is made of pure mineral material versus a dike, which will tend to be uh, igneous in nature. But we do have, it looks like up here, there's a really cool feature right here. And let's see if I can get that in the camera just so and see if you can see that here. So here we have our uh, vein, our light brown vein coming up, but then it terminates right here. But if you look just above, it picks up and continues on. So we have right here a very small fault with just a few centimeters or inches of offset. Um, and you might play the fun games if you've learned about faults in other, my other videos, like my Geology 101 videos. Play the game of figuring out what kind of fault it is. Looks like the fault is steeply dipping down to the right. So it's oriented this way. And we have this side that's moved down, this opposite side on the right that has moved up. So if the fault is dipping to the right, then this left side would be the foot wall. It's the area below the fault. The right side would be the hanging wall. And since in this case we have the foot wall down, the left side down, and the right side, the hanging wall up, this would be a reverse fault, very high angle reverse fault. Just a fun little small fault there that has cut the rocks. The other fun thing you can do here to play games is think about um, age relationships. So we have the tough breccia, we have this vein, and then we have the fault, and see if you can put together the sequence of events for all three of those uh, features to form. So in this case, we have the rock is cut by the vein. So the rock was there first, the vein came second, and then the vein is cut by the fault, which would be the third event we have there. Very cool. So as we move down kind of around the way from that interesting feature, we have more of this tough breccia, just fragmented, but it, unlike where we started, it's just not, just not organized into beds. This is all just one big massive deposit. Um, now, as we switch again over to sort of interpretation mode, um, the story of much of these rocks here in the Krišuvik system and many of the areas on the Reykjanes Peninsula is a lot of these areas formed when volcanoes erupted beneath glaciers. And that would of course present the right conditions for this to become explosive, right? You've got glacial ice melting from the magma, the, the lava, it's fragmenting uh, the lava, it's, it's explosive as, as the magma melts the ice and that water flashes to steam. That's an expansive process, an explosive process. And that breaks the rock up into all these chunks like we can see here and then they've been cemented and glued together partly by compaction and partly by uh, some mineral deposits cementing them together looking up a little higher now we're down to the road cut we can see some of the bedding and the organization of the layers coming back into play but if you think about just how dynamic this system would be if, if our interpretation's right and this is a subglacial volcanic deposit you can imagine just how explosive and it's just a chaotic mess in terms of uh, eruptions and um, material being deposited sliding and so you might see faults or material that's sort of sloughing off as the material gets deposited um, further over time and then just kind of ending the video here since we're kind of a ways from the van here you can see down at this end just how steep uh, the bedding is here. Here the layers are steeply dip, dipping down to the right. So you can actually pick out some of the layering here in the rocks. So just kind of a chaotic mix. This is actually going in a very different direction than the layering we looked at uh, where we began just a few steps down the road by, by the van. Fantastic stuff.
Hey, well, thanks for joining me for this edition of Random Road Cuts. Hope you enjoy just exploring and learning and making observations together. It's always such a treat and so much fun. Hope you uh, can support the channel. If you'd like to go to the video description and there's some links there and we'll see you next time. Take care.